introduce, he does not need any introduction because he is not an outsider. He is not a guest. Uh, he is coming back home. He is our professor emeritus. All of you would have seen on our website, but you may not have met because he is physically visiting after three years. So thanks to COVID that, you know, we could not meet him and, you know, all of you here, they are all, maximum is third year because all fourth year, final year students are out okay. doing industry practice. And that's why they would not have met you last time when you visited. So Professor Sugata Mitra, educational technology and uh, if you know and if you have cared to see on the, our website and also read the GC where his profile is given, you know, you know that he is known for many reasons. Uh, of course, and I am not going to, uh, you know, speak, neither I am competent, competent to speak about all that he has done, but we know that you people do watch TEDx on YouTube and uh, he has got the TEDx Best Speaker Award in one year and subsequently he may have got many also. He has been a Devang Mehta. If you know Devang Mehta, he is a very, very, you know, known name, NASCOM person. So, you know, so he got Devang Mehta Award. And, uh, the third, only three points that I would mention. Third and the most important is the hole in the wall experiment. Uh, I see some nod there. So, you know, that uh, in from NIIT where he was with NIIT for good number of years before he went to UK at Newcastle uh, University in educational technology department and then he also was a visiting professor at Media Lab MIT. So brief highlights so you know uh, and uh, one more thing that I wanted to mention which I just now yes last time when he came here he conducted what uh, is called SOUL, so self-organized learning environments. So, you know, today he is going to speak on AI and uh, learning, uh, but then he is a strong believer and he has proved through many experiments and published many works where he believes that, you know, the least intervention by the teacher is actually in the interest of learner. So if you create a right environment and just throw a question, a problem, <coughs> the learner will find the best solution. So uh, to make an extreme statement, teacher is not required in that <laughs> sense. So you know, and I know, you know, unless you make <coughs> the extreme statement, the message also does not go. And he is notoriously known for making always the uh, statements which are very radical, but then they kind of, you know, stimulate the thinking in the mind of listeners. So I will not stand between him and you more any more, and uh, I'm sure he will create a lot of <coughs> provoke, provoke you to think and ask questions on this very interesting and very contemporary topic because we know that we have been discussing about uh, what is that? <laughs> Without my saying. So over to you, Sugata. Okay. Well, thanks very much. You know, what, what, I, what I found most uh, impressive is that uh, she said all this out of memory. Did you notice? Yes. Incredible. Can any of you repeat all, all of that? <laughs> no way. <laughs> so that's quite an act. Anyway, so, uh, you know, I... Uh, I would, sorry, one second, I will take Sugata. I think I must introduce our... No, 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 no. just, you don't have to get up, but I am just saying, Professor Sushmita Mitra, and all of us are going to hear her tomorrow. So see you tomorrow in her interactive session. Gosh, now, now she has <laughs> deflated me completely. <laughs> <laughs>
was just getting into the, the, the thing, you know. Okay, now first of all, good afternoon or whatever. Uh, this uh, first of all, the thing is that there are two people. In order to look at whom, I will get a crick in my neck. Yeah, Have you noticed from the geometry of this space? <laughs> I mean, either I have to totally ignore them <laughs> or, or I'll get a crick in my neck. So, um, so there's a design flaw. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, I, uh, in, in this rather brief visit from Calcutta to Delhi, um, I got the five, five or six, including some Zoom calls, five or six uh, invitations to speak about guess what? Chat GPT. Okay, uh, from all over the place. I mean, there were two or three from India, then there, there are from several other countries. Uh, the interesting thing is. That I don't know anything at all about ChatGPT. <laughs> okay, so the questions are like, so uh, can you talk to us about the applications of ChatGPT? Uh, can you tell tell us uh, what will happen to the future of uh, you know text generators like ChatGPT, etc., etc. Um, so I first thought that. Uh, how would I answer a question like that? So I could, of course, say, oh, you know, Chat GPT is the greatest invention after sliced bread, <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> but that isn't going to be a very exciting thing to say. Um, I think a good question, counter question to ask is, how does Chat GPT work? Okay, and uh, as soon as I asked that question to myself and to various people, I found nobody knew. So we are all trying to figure out what will chat GPT do without knowing anything about how it works. So it's a bit like if you saw a helicopter for the first time in your life and somebody said, what can we do with this? And you say, it would make a bloody good table fan. <laughs> and you have no idea what it, what it is meant for. Okay, so that's more or less, I think, where we are with chat GPT. So I, I, will, I will come to that in a moment. But I had some questions, actually, uh, which are totally off the topic, which is uh, AI and... Uh, <coughs> AI and what? Uh, something. Uh, AI and learning. Learning. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so, okay, AI and learning. I'll, I'll come to AI and learning eventually, but uh, I had a couple of questions. First of all, wh wh why is this place called Listening Tree? We were supposed to listen here. <laughs> Unless somebody speaks. Who is supposed to listen? So we can the, the tree. The tree. <laughs> the tree. The tree is unfortunately their lives are spent listening. <laughs> they don't do anything else. So <laughs> every tree is a listening tree. But really, seriously. Because I, I think there's a column in some newspaper speaking, called the yeah, speaking, speaking, speaking Tree. Yeah, speaking Tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, so this is not a speaking tree. No, no, this no, is a listening, this is a listening listen, tree. Listen. And who do you listen to? The, to the chap sitting here. <laughs> is that? No, I'm, I'm that's serious. A, that's the idea. I'm yeah, seriously yeah. asking. That's, that's, the that's the idea. That's the idea. Yes. Yes. Oh, so so it's so it's a kind of. Uh, Sort of a Buddha-like situation. No. Yeah. Buddha, is it? <laughs> that was the Bodhi tree. Yeah, but, but you know, as far as I know, does anybody know this? Did Buddha ever speak from below the Bodhi tree? No idea. I don't think he did. No, no, no. As I, soon as I got the knowledge, he left that. I, I don't think he spoke a single word from below the Bodhi tree. Below the Bodhi tree, he was zonked out of his mind. <laughs> <laughs> so when he finally opened his eyes, <coughs> I think this girl called Sujata fed him. Yes. Because, you know, he, he was uh, not, <laughs> not in any condition to do anything. And then I think he just got up. Um, if you go to Bodh Gaya, it's quite interesting. Apparently, he got up and walked a little bit away from the tree. And stood 
in one place which has now a name. It's called the place of the unblinking gaze. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which means he went somewhere over there, kept looking at the Bodhi tree, and I'm making this up, probably said, what the hell? <laughs> Something like that. <coughs> then, of course, they caught hold of him and said, you know, you can't get away with this. So, so then he had to speak, but he didn't speak from under the Bodhi tree. Um, then what happened? Then I think where he first spoke was Sarnath. Sa Sarnath, if, you, if you've been to that part of the, it's a very interesting place actually. He spoke in Sarnath and that lecture got picked up by his students and uh, quite happily uh, plagiarized um, and they started giving that lecture as their own, <laughs> okay, one by one. This is as far as I understand it. And then the whole place just disappeared. All trace of him, his life, his the Bodhi tree itself was dead, uh, the works. Does anybody know how it was rediscovered? Gosh, man, you really should know this, you know. This, this is great stuff. It, it's, it's like a detective novel. There's a chap called uh, Cunningham, uh, often referred to as Cunningham the Great. <laughs> Cunningham was the first director general of the Indian Archaeological Society, the very first in 19 something or the other. On a trip to Bihar, he saw a tip of a temple, something like this, sticking out, just a little thing, <coughs> sticking out of the place and he said, oh, this, what is this? I mean, who's put this here? And uh, took a spade or whatever, started scraping the sides. He started going like this, and after after some time, he said, "Holy tumoli, this thing is the top of a temple." Mm -hmm. And he kept digging and digging, digging, digging. Finally, got to the bottom, and there was an inscription in Pali which said, uh, "This is where the Buddha got uh, his enlightenment under the Bodhi tree." And so, where's the Bodhi tree? And he looked around and it was dead. Just the stump, completely dead. And he, uh, this is all recorded, okay. There's a place in Calcutta called the Asiatic Society. You'll find it, find the record, uh, the, the actual notes there. He called one of his assistants, somebody around, come here. Uh, you know, no, I'm not saying come here, but that's what I'm, I'm pretending to be Cunningham. So he said, come here, and he said, uh, just look around to see if you find the sapling of an Ashok tree somewhere, a tiny one. <coughs> if you find it, just bring it here, okay? So this guy went on board, this tiny little Ashok tree sapling, and uh, he said, just plant it right there near that dead stump. So plant it right there, and it's, it's a whatever for. He said, you know, if you don't do that, a religion will die, okay? So he planted that. So what is standing in Bodh Gaya, the big huge Ashok tree, is actually the sapling planted by Kanihan. Oh. Mm. <laughs> okay. that, that, that is uh, where all those festoons are hanging and, and this and that and the other thing. Then he dug up the entire history of what happened. Of, of the Buddha, of Sarnath, of, the, uh, of his disciples, etc., 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 of Nalanda and, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, finally, everybody came to know the story, which you would know vaguely. You wouldn't pro probably know all of this, but I, I found it in a book, so I, I, it was like a detective novel, so I just read through the whole thing. Uh, but you know about the story. That he was under this tree, he got his enlightenment, then he gave his lectures, the Buddhism started off, and so on and so forth. Um, it all started with a question, isn't it? The question had nothing to do with Buddhism. The question had to do with this thing sticking out of the ground and Cunningham standing there and saying, what the hell is this? Okay. Uh, that's how that's how it happens. I mean, it's, it's not as though 
you know, today I shall make a great discovery, ladies and gentlemen. If it doesn't happen like that, it happens with what the hell is that? Okay, and uh, so it's a question. And okay, you are not the Buddha. And what, what was the Buddha saying? Uh, if you read what uh, the dialogues, you find something very interesting. Most of the time, people come and say, "Lord." You know, what will happen to my child? I'm making this up. <laughs> or what will happen to my child? And the Buddha kind of looks at him. He used to fix people with his stare. So look at him for time and say, good question. <laughs> that's what all he did. <coughs> and the guy said, that's what I meant, your Lord. You see, the thing is, he is not well right now, but I am sure that he will get better. And the Buddha would say, that is really worth considering. And so, you see, I found out that there are some medicines available for the particular kind of disease that are there. And he would say, good, good. What do you think? <laughs> or something like that. So, he is considered one of the greatest teachers on the planet. Okay. Uh, what he did was, according to me, what I would call minimally invasive. Education. <laughs> okay. So, the key words being, what do you think? You, know, you can try it with your friends if you want to drive them up the wall. Every time they ask a question, just say, yeah, yeah, what do you think? <laughs> just see how, how many times you can get away with it. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, come to another one. Another guy. Have you heard of Socrates? Yep. Okay. The other great lived around the same time as the Buddha, 2500 BC, but in Greece. And uh, Socrates was a very popular teacher. Every time he would gather together, they used to gather together in a place not very dissimilar to this. I've seen it. And the, the only thing missing is the tree. There's no tree. <laughs> you sit there and there's an amphitheater like this and <laughs> he would come and sit there. They didn't, they didn't have um, smartphones and things, so there was no announcement. He would sit there and some passing student would say, Hey, <laughs> Socrates better. And, and she would go and sit down there. And, and then another one, and another one, and another one, because they all wanted to. So, what's he going to do today? And uh, finally, when everybody is around, uh, usually, uh, there's one chap who comes late always to these things, yeah, yes, yes. and uh, yeah, uh, there will be one chap like that who will come late, looking very apologetic, and uh, usually turning like this. I was very busy here or something, you know, and, and comes in late. So one chap like that came and said, "I am very sorry." And uh, Socrates said, "Is it good to be sorry?" And uh, he kind of asked any of the students, said, so it is good to be sorry? And uh, the student said, sorry? And, <laughs> and, and he said, can you answer sorry with sorry? <laughs> By now, everybody is sucked into the discussion. What is he talking about? <laughs> okay. And then, well, you should, you should read it for yourself. It, uh, uh, nobody, he never wrote anything down. Yeah, he used to hate writing. Okay, there's a beautiful paragraph. He's talking to one of his students called Phaedrus. He says, Phaedrus, there's nothing more terrible than writing. So you take a piece of written matter, and if you ask it a question, it keeps on saying the same thing over and over again. It never says a single extra thing. Well, how stupid is that? So he used to hate it. <coughs> but anyhow... <coughs> His sessions with students <coughs> got documented by one of the students. He said, okay, you might hate writing. I don't hate writing. I'm going to write it all down. And Plato wrote it all down. Uh, the most famous of his books being The Republic. But if you read The Republic, you, you'll be completely frustrated because he doesn't teach anything. He only asks. Okay, And, and the questions get more and more zonked out. <laughs> okay, that's the only way I can describe it. So, as the questions get more like that and the students get, 
uh, you know, the students would say, should you be asking this question? And you say, Socrates, <laughs> should I? <laughs> so, and, and like that. So uh, this went on for a, for a little while and as perhaps you know that the Greek government didn't think this was a good idea. Why? <clears throat> because he was making the listeners think. think. Mm -hmm. Listeners are supposed to listen. Listeners are not supposed to think. So making them think, went to the Senate, he was found guilty of making people think and sentenced to death yes. by hemlock, he was drinking poison. So, uh, it, uh, uh, so it, which he did quite happily actually. He didn't seem to mind at all. Uh, I, I think, uh, I think one of the last things was with, uh, with the thing where his students are standing, sir, what is this? Uh, and uh, he said, uh, should you feel sorry? So, minimally invasive. Okay. So now, chat GPT <laughs> and AI. Who asked the questions? You do, isn't it? Have, have you guys used it? Yes. Sir. Okay. And been suitably impressed? Yes. Sometimes. Sometimes. Any case where you were disappointed? Yes, sir. Till now. No. No? There was a yes. yes sir. There was one. Sir, when yes. it comes to cannot command the emotions of a human being, to export, uh, that way it, it gets a little bit. Clustered. Little clustered. Yeah. Did, did you have an example of something? Yeah. It couldn't do math properly. Like if you ask it to do a little bit of math, like 4 mod 2, it will do, say 3. Any sort of expression, like expression of uh, in terms of poetry, in terms of um, yeah, in terms of describing any scene, in terms of anything. It couldn't express it the way um, humans express them or even close to so it. So there is a pattern. It, so yes. it starts with first Firstly, I would like to describe like this. Then it comes to the second paragraph. Like secondly, and then uh, in the conclusion, it writes in the conclusion. I would write it's very it. monotonic. It's very. Um, very it's like it's like broken into pieces. It's like it feels like there's a structure or there's not there's no coherence. There's no flow. But you can still write a poetry it, poem, right? Yeah. Yes, but the writing. And the poem has a meter. It has rhyme. It has rhythm. And that. That, that can be you have seen those. that example. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pro at usually. It can write jokes also. Oh. Yes. Have you tried uh, getting jokes out of it? One the, uh, old uh, friend and colleague of mine tried it just a couple of days ago. He, he, he said, uh, uh, Tell me a joke about uh, tomatoes. And it actually popped up with it said, The tomato turned red because it saw salad dressing. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a pretty good job for Chad GPT. <laughs> so, uh, a friend of mine uh, back at my home uh, used Chad GPT for his SOPs hmm. to apply for foreign universities and he got into three or four universities. He didn't write a single word of his SOPs. He just used Chad GPT for <laughs> SOPs and he got through. But jolly good, I mean, that's how it should be. <laughs> 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 So, so the thing is, uh, are we using the helicopter as a table fan, <laughs> or, or so? Now you tell me, how how does it work? How does it do all this? Any any idea? You can guess like mad. Just say what comes into your head. So it's a language model. Google like wo, how does it put it all into a proper uh, uh, grammatically correct uh, it so it has been trained to do so, like so designed kya, yeah, the, 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 what do you mean by design what is that design yes, sir, somebody said language model what is that sir it is like training <coughs> parameters multiple millions of parameters to do the parameters to do what to form coherent so sentences. To give to the form, output uh, yeah. based on our prompt, prompt or input, desired output. Yeah, you're getting there, but you're you're kind of saying, sir, I understand how helicopter works. So, under a man is a fan, he's very jealous. 
<laughs> so it's it's a, some, somewhat like that. So uh, anyway, so when I started getting these invitations, I said I have to say something sensible about Chat GPT. I better understand something like that. So uh, the first thing I bumped into were neural networks, obviously. When I learned programming, I, there were no new, I mean, there were neural networks, but people said that you cannot make neural networks with present day computers because there's not enough power. So I said, okay, so they must have crossed that hurdle. So can I write one? So I made a neural network. Okay, it, it's surprising, it, it takes very little bit of code. Yeah, yeah it, it is kind of the, 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 the father of all engines. It's just a <laughs> tiny little piece of code and <coughs> you make the neural networks. And I discovered a couple of things. Uh, I was trying, first thing I tried was that can I make a neural network where I give three inputs, X, Y and Z. And the output is how far away it's from the origin. So it's square root of x square plus y square plus z square plus, you know, how far is it from the origin? So, okay, so three inputs means I need three neurons. One output means I need one neuron. How many should I have in the middle? I started reading and I realized, to my horror, that nobody knows. They said, yeah, try three, try four, try five. You know, that kind of thing. So I kind of sat back like the Buddha and said, good question. <laughs> you know, how, many, how many should I put in the middle? So I put three in the middle. Didn't work. I put five in the middle. Sort of worked. I started training it with a hundred sets of data. And suddenly started working. Working to about 93, 94%. So 7% of the results it would get completely wrong. But 93% were more or less pretty much correct. And what did it have inside it? It had a total of 10. Three inputs, one output, four, and six in the middle, the hidden there. 10 neurons, and each one had a, you know, has a weight. I mean, the way it works is that you throw an input at it. This neuron at the input will send that to all the hidden there. Boom, 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 sends it all over the place. Like it does inside our heads. They're all connected. Except that each input, as it goes, it either reduces or increases or something happens to it because it has to travel. That lands up as the six. And then the six send out six inputs into the one output guy. That fellow produces the output. So what you get are ten numbers. 0.5375 and it's calculating how far away it's from the origin. So I said, but it doesn't know anything. There's no formula inside it. It doesn't say x square and square root and it doesn't know any of those stuff. So what is it doing? That's when I thought of the helicopter. I said, I'm trying to use the helicopter as a table fan. <laughs> I have no idea what it's doing. Uh, with just 10 of those decimal numbers, it one thing is for sure, it doesn't know anything. So if it doesn't know anything, but you give it the coordinates and it says 6 inches, that's always right. It's a bit like, it's a bit like us. If I tell you, how far away is, how far apart is this inches? Five or six. Did you do square root of x square plus y square? You didn't do any such thing, right? What did you do? You intuited. So I looked at those ten numbers and I said, is this intuition then? Ten weights somewhere. Then any microbe can do it. It's five or six inches. It has nothing to do with knowing. So it's not like the AI of my times. AI of my times was, we must analyze the thinking process down to its last detail. Then we must program the whole thing. The program will be, you know, 10 million lines of code. 
we will program all of psychology, we will program all of this and all of that, and then finally we will have an electronic brain. They used to be called electronic brains, and it will do everything. It turned out you don't need anything like that at all. You need maybe 50 lines of code and a huge matrix of numbers. You throw in a number, the number travels through, intuits an output. I can't think of any other word except intuits. It's like him saying <laughs> five or six inches. If I said, well, how do you know it's five or six inches? What will he say? It's all cows at there. That's why he, he can't say what he did. Okay, and the neural network can't say what he did either. So in computer science, it's one of those rare cases where we ran across structures which you can program, but where you don't know what it is going to do. And when it does something, there is no way to find out why it did that. Okay. So what do you do as the creator of that? So you create it, then you watch what it does. That's all you can do. And say, oh, you that. What happens if I change the input to this? Such a woo that. That kind of thing. Okay. Have you heard of Stephen Hawking? Yes. Well, I tell you a very uh, seldom quoted line from Stephen Hawking because it's politically very incorrect. Stephen Hawking said about the universe, a creator who watches helplessly as his creation unfolds. Okay, helplessly being the key word. <laughs> that sort of thing. Okay, so that's more or less what neural network programmers are like. <coughs> so, so AI is not the way we, you know AI is going to take over the universe. It's not that kind of AI. <coughs> All right. So then, then I started on my quest for Chat GPT. To the next step. Okay, I know how the neural network works, and these things are called. Uh, Long name, the feed forward back propagation network. That's, that only works if you know what, if you can train it, if you know what the input is, what the output is. But what if I don't know? I mean, if I, when I say make me a joke about a tomato, I don't have an answer in my mind. So I'm feeding it one word after the other, one word after the other. It's listening, it's producing an output. So that's done with another kind of network. That's called a recurrent neural network. Uh, which what it does is something like this. You give it a word, you say, who? Now, in the entire English language, what can who be followed by? What word could come after who? Is. Who is, who are, who am, who this, who that. Let's say, I, the next word I type is am. So, who am? Now, after am, what can you have? I. I. <laughs> now, there's no, no controversy. There's only one word that can come, it's I. So, <coughs> if, if the previous word was to modify the probability of the next word and the, this was to pro modify the probability of the next word, then after some time you say, nothing else other than this could be said. Okay. Uh, they gave it a name. These, these computer science guys, they don't read, they, they think humanities is a very stupid subject. So they don't read any. So they gave it a name. They called it a long short term memory. You see the faces? Yeah. Without without knowing that uh, social sciences for donkeys, he has, has known about something called the short term memory. <coughs> the long short term memory that you've got to remember the whole sequence. As you know the whole sequence, you can start predicting the next one. Then, what, do you, what to do next? Okay. Uh, imagine a matrix. Okay. I mean, I could, I could get up and write it, but I don't like getting up. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you better imagine it. Imagine this matrix. So, you've got who am I? This side you've got who am I? Now, who with who? 
Now, who is never followed by who? Put a zero. Who am? Put a one. Who I? Zero. Then am. Fill that matrix up. Very simple. It's a matrix which will only produce who am I. <coughs> as soon as you feed in who, it will say who am I. Now, imagine that matrix to have, hold your breath, 250 billion rows and 250 billion columns. Okay. And you fill it up. What do you fill it up with? You just read the internet, everything on the internet. Every single word on the internet still doesn't total up to 250 billion. So you've got the whole of the internet in this direction, the same thing on this direction. And fill the probabilities. Okay. Won't that return, uh, return a lot of redundancy? It will. It will. So hang on. So so you've got the, 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 the 250 billion or whatever. And what she's saying is, you know, the word who may have come 2,000 times, uh, uh, 2 million times in there. <coughs> the next step you do is, is to collapse all the who's into one single who and so on and so forth. Adjust the probability. So, but that's only a bit of math. That's, that's easy. So you do that. You've got this gigantic matrix, possibly one of the biggest ever created. Okay. And now if you feed it who, it predicts a word. Do you have any control over what word it might predict? I mean, you don't know what, you know, what had what probability. So, OpenAI made a matrix. You feed in who. Who am I, comma, I often wonder. Comes out. Google said we'll beat them. They've got 250 billion rows and columns. We'll make it 500 billion, 500 billion rows and columns. And the ability is called lambda. It had a problem. You feed it who, I'm, I'm making this part up, but you feed it who, unlike chat GPT, which said, who am I? Or, or, you know, who am I? I wonder, I thought, you know, conclusion, I have a question, <laughs> something like that. Google's lambda said, who the hell are you? <laughs> okay. Now you realize why chat GPT got released earlier than Lambda. Okay. Lambda is aggressively rude and Lambda tells lies. Who am I? I'm a chimpanzee that talks. What? Did you just make that up? Yes, I'm afraid I did. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <clears throat> They're still struggling with, what do you do with this? The human brain has one trillion. You know, we're only that far away from it. 250 billion, 500 billion, one trillion. So you can build one trillion, but now everybody is hesitating. Because if this abusive liar is what happened with 500 billion, what will come out of that one trillion? doesn't raise your opinion of mankind very much. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Something awful will come out of that. <laughs> All right. So we don't know what. But of course, somebody will build it. I believe somebody is trying three trillion. They're going to jump the one, one trillion. Well, one trillion is boring. That's our brains. We know all about that. You go to three trillion. That's superhuman. That's alien. And now see what it says. Okay. That's as far as I've understood the helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so maybe even I'm making a table fan with it, but th this is as far as I've got, mainly because my damn laptops run out of memory. <laughs> so so I, I've got to, you know, find, a, find find some way to get around that. Anyway, um, so if you've got this gigantic matrix. Now you can understand how more or less it works. You can say, it says, who am I? You say, uh, say it like Shakespeare. And, you know, 
who art thou, Othello, or something like that. <laughs> and you say, oh, very good, uh, uh, you know, uh, say it in Japanese. And it says, Hashimoto. You know, I actually got quite a shock because I was fooling around with it. And I, I typed in saying, I wish you could speak in Bengali. Mm. It's a written out a paragraph in Bengali saying, of course I can, what do you think I can't? <laughs> so so it, it, it is already superhuman. There are no human beings that can speak that many languages at the same time. Anyhow, so you've got the matrix. Now, I'm not interested in going further with this because that's your job. Okay? <coughs> Computer science, AI. You guys have to figure out what happens next, what, how do I program it, how do I make it say sentences, etc. Uh, I'll give it a shot, but I'm not going further. But I'm interested in something else. What I'm interested in is how does, is, is this how we work? Is that what's going on inside? It would be such a simple and elegant explanation of thinking. <coughs> simple because it's just a matrix. Elegant because it says we don't actually think. We think we are thinking. <laughs> okay. Just as chat GPT thinks you're thinking. <coughs> Further problem. Why does it produce perfectly grammatical English? I didn't program any rules of grammar into it. How come it doesn't make any mistakes with grammar? Because in the 500 and, you know, in the 250 billion by 250 billion matrix of the stuff from the internet, everything's with the right grammar. So when you pick up using the probabilities, it will never get the grammar wrong. Not because it knows the grammar, mm. but because it intuits the grammar. Okay. Conclusion, grammar is not important. <laughs> oh, Panini, what happens to... <laughs> <laughs> well, he wasted his time <laughs> trying to generalize rules. Oh, this one can solve. I made one which can solve quadratic equations. Does it? Very good job. Tiny little fellow. Solves quadratic equations. But my conclusion when I stare at that, what he's trying to say is that formula is useless. I don't need that formula. Because this is a much easier way to, to solve quadratic equations. So, so, AI and learning, I think it's not so much a story of sci-fi good news. One day it will get me a job, one day it will this, it's no longer important to learn a language. Uh, I can write anything I want, I can, uh, you know, make up any joke I want, I can, uh, this is a power to the people. It's not about that. What it's trying to tell us is we don't think. Now that is much more serious. Isn't it? I can see from your faces that you do think it's serious. <laughs> that we think we are thinking. <coughs> That's it's kind of horrible, isn't it? Not even an automaton. It's one trillion neurons, one trillion neural connections with their weights and biases, <coughs> getting an input, bling, 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 producing an output in perfect Shakespeare in English. And we survived this long. And we, we survived this long uh, uh, and, uh, we, you know, and, and we also uh, conclusively proved to ourselves that we are better off than trees and rats and bats and cats and dogs and everything. And we, we just need a God complex as humans have. <laughs> That's why. So, uh, so I am, I think, I think the AI guys should talk to the social science guys. It's the right time. Okay. And it will be fun. I can tell you that. Those of you who are programmers, it will be fun. Read Sigmund Freud. Blow your mind. <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, that conversation is required uh, and uh, I'm trying to start it. I'm trying to start it and uh, before we, okay, we'll have a few minutes to discuss. 
So just one last thing. Uh, the way I tried to start it was to take books that all of you have heard of, all of you know they are very important, and all of you know you are never going to read them. Okay. Rig Veda. Wonderful. Is anybody ever going to read it? Sorry, sir. <laughs> Next life. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Bible. Okay. Uh, or if you want to get away from religion, go to uh, philosophy. Uh, Plato's Republic. Everybody knows. I mean, that is the foundations of human civilization. Are you ever going to read it? No way. You might read some expert commentary on it or a synopsis written by somebody who, whatever he thought he's written, but not the book. I made a collection of about 12 books, which are like this, which uh, you know are important, should be read, etc., but you won't read them. Um, you know the theory of evolution, okay, <laughs> started off by Charles Darwin through his book, The Origin of Species. You can get a free download from the internet, but try reading it. Man, that guy, his one sentence is a paragraph. <laughs> okay, no way you're ever going to read that. Sigmund Freud, The Interpretation of Dreams. By page 50, you're so disgusted. <laughs> this is it. I'm not going any further with this. And so on and so forth. Another guy called Immanuel Kant. It's famous book called uh, um, A Critique of Pure Reason. And uh, please, I mean, don't even try reading it. Okay, you leave the university. <laughs> so, these books. So I said, okay, I'm never going to read them, but can I write a program so that I can ask those books questions? I said, what do you think of this? And the book should answer. Okay, I called it a synthetic thought generator. Synthor. All right. I wrote one, the first one I wrote was on the Rig Ved, because Rig Ved you can download the whole thing very easily and uh, then I converted it into a synthor and I could ask it questions and it is pretty much mind blowing because you know you say what should I, what, what should be my vision of life and the Rig Ved says in my words uh, uh, take a swig of soma first, okay, and, <laughs> and everything will be clear. Okay, <laughs> so, that that sort of thing. I said, oh my God, what is this? You know, right? Enlightenment. <laughs> Enlightenment. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the Rig Ved Sinthar, I wrote it. It then I then I said, okay, can I? Is this what it really says? It's the English translation. So it got the Sanskrit one. That also free download. So now you can get the English one and you say, I don't believe you, tell me in Sanskrit. So it will show you the Sanskrit, shows you how to pronounce the Sanskrit. And finally, I got a, a Keralite website where, where they actually chant it for you. Okay, so I got all of that. They put it all together and sent it to Microsoft, to the store. Thinking that, you know, they're going to say, what rubbish is this? They actually put it in the store. And said so this, this was in 2021. This is this is the Rig Veda Synthor, and uh, it, you can you can talk to it. So anyway, so after that I got enthused. I wrote 12 of them, on the 12 books that I had shortlisted. So Freud is there, Darwin is there, everything. Last bit. Now I've got these 12 Synthors. <coughs> I can not only talk to these 12 books. I can make the books talk to each other. <coughs> Right? So, I took the Buddha Sintar. It's a Sintar made on the Dhammapad. And I asked Buddha, <laughs> it sounds funny, I asked the Buddha <laughs> sitting under this <laughs> I asked the Buddha, of what use is love? Why is it there? So, Buddha replies, <laughs> saying, it is useless. It is the cause of all pain. <laughs> okay? So that, so I cut and pasted that, put it into Sigmund Freud. I said, Dr. Freud, this is what the Buddha had to say about why love exists. 
and you I, I don't know what you're expecting you won't Something get it <laughs> Sigmund Freud said sometimes in a railway compartment if you have a co-passenger who continuously talks to you whether you want to or not be assured that he's probably not even bought a ticket <laughs> And I said, this is a very insulting statement about the Buddha from Sigmund Freud. So I took the whole thing and I went to Charles Darwin. I said, here's a sensible looking chap. I said, sir, Buddha said love is the cause of all suffering. Mr. Freud says Buddha got into a train without buying a ticket. And I, what is going on? And Charles Darwin says, there was an emperor in India called... Akbar. He had a hundred thousand pigeons and since he didn't know much about pigeons or evolution, he kept them in the same cage, in the same aviary. However, it has been documented that the different breeds of pigeons remain intact. They don't mate across the breeds, so you don't get cross breeds. So different breeds can be kept in the same aviary, but enclosure, possibly this could be the reason why nature evolved love. Okay. <laughs> to keep birds in the same aviary. So this was the conversation which I reported to chat GPT. And I said, you know, Darwin says you can keep the different species of birds in the same aviary and they won't crossbreed. Chad GPT said Darwin never wrote anything about aviaries. <laughs> okay. I said, uh, he mentioned the Indian emperor Akbar. And Chad GPT said, I am very sorry. Darwin said you can keep. 100,000 pigeons in the same area <laughs> and they do not cross feet. <laughs> and I said, and what about the Buddha? And finally, just to taper and end our argument, Chad GPT said, I'm afraid I don't know much about the Buddha. <laughs> so this is uh, what's going on. I don't know if it, if it had anything to do with AI and learning, but this is what came out. Now we have a couple of minutes maybe for, for you. Uh, I can be the listening tree. Underneath the tree. <laughs> you can be a listening tree underneath the tree. Underneath the tree, right. <laughs> so when is Lambda coming out? Pichai says very shortly because he's in trouble. He's <laughs> <laughs> in real bad trouble. So, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I, th this problem has been reported not only by Google, but actually Microsoft was building its own. Now they bought OpenAI. But they also re said that beyond a certain size, these uh, so-called <coughs> text generators, for some reason, become uh, abusive and uh, start making up things <coughs> beyond a certain size. Uh, is that because they use like the the entire internet as the um, sort of like a source? Um, I don't know if I'm using the right word. Because uh, uh, the internet can be a wild place. Yeah, obviously, but that even ChatGPT has. But I think OpenAI did something. Uh, they put 10,000 human beings before they released it <laughs> to actually go on retraining it. That's not very fair because uh -huh. okay. And, and then if you take a, something the size of Lambda, you're going to need 100,000 people. And that's the reason they have opened it to the public, because they, they look at what people are putting in. So by now they would have, you know, read my conversation with the Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, like a lot of like chat GPT you were mentioning chat GPT and then open AI. So what is your perspective regarding AI? It will start like a BB like for like AI, uh, the AI generated pictures which are we are getting, they are getting stolen from some artists and then they are getting uh, reduced to some form of AI photos. And this can also happen with content. Like if we are writing some content, chat GPT can steal it and then 
give it to a user and they can use it so it can also create a lot of issues of copyright infringement and all of that yeah well so, if you if, if you look at it in the <coughs> in the old classical sense that it is storing and retrieving and sending exactly. you use those words that it will pick it up and send it it doesn't do those things what it does is that it uses a predictive matrix to to recreate it so it doesn't know anything you know that's where we were starting from it's actually questioning the idea of copyright if you produce something if a monkey types on a typewriter is whatever comes out is is that is that the monkey's copyright you would say no it doesn't know what it's doing what chat gpt is saying and this is the troublesome part is that we are like that we don't know what we're doing it's a good point to start to to stop <laughs> so i i have yes so one very common uh, question is there that philosophy and physics uh, is there any tight coupling or it is uh, yeah one after another or uh, yes yeah, somewhere it is loosely coupled somewhere it is tightly coupled and all well the literature and ai uh, relation uh, is like that um, or uh, or what we are trying for it is very open <coughs> i think still now well it, it is it is very open and uh, uh, i mean i i know that uh, that, uh, that if the size of the matrix is beyond a certain point then uh, it does contain multiple literary styles inside it which it can cross fertilize so to speak so that's how it's able to say that you know if it says something and you say now uh, uh, say it like shakespeare's and further than that you could say say it like shakespeare wrote in julius caesar and it will even do that okay it totally dependent on the matrix size so the point for our discussion was to say that do not use words like it knows or it understands it doesn't know anything it doesn't understand anything it intuits that's the closest word i could get to but the first part is a more interesting question uh, because we have data now that originally uh, materialistic physics of 19th century newton and then so on and so forth uh, at that time the popular opinion was that uh, physics has replaced philosophy physics has given a firm ground to philosophy and uh, all this nonsense that was going on for hundreds of years can be brushed aside uh, the religious philosophers the normal philosophers everybody out of the window then when the copenhagen interpretation 1920s came and then the physicist said well uh, is this glass over here and you say yes newtonian physics is right here so where okay you measure x y z so measure it okay uh, <coughs> can you add a few more decimal places yeah sure better instrument to put some more some more some more and then suddenly it breaks down because it says well you know that 23rd decimal point it is sometimes 5 and sometimes 3 sometimes 5 and sometimes 3 because this thing is actually not static so then you say well that means you don't actually know where it is uh so the physicist said no but but if i know how fast it's moving then i then i know exactly where it is all right so they tell me the speed and then everything broke down because you could either tell the speed or you could tell the position you couldn't tell both the famous heisenberg uh, principle you know but at that point in time physicists of course arrogant people so even then the physicists said uh, you know heisenberg uh, heisenberg's <coughs> uncertainty principle is a is a one liner that is greater than all the philosophers put together okay or something like that they did all of that and then came uh, schrodinger's equation that things which exist is a collapse of uh, you know uh, wave functions 
that everything's actually a wave function it collapses at a certain point by by that time everybody was beginning to say well i mean are you are you all right do you need an aspirin or something <laughs> okay and then came the most recent in particle physics which is uh, where is it we don't know uh, when did it come into existence we don't know does it actually exist the most recent answer is we don't know and through us right back into plato's time so now the philosophers are laughing from the other side of their face <laughs> and saying now ab <laughs> bolo <laughs> so so this is this is the cycle if that is the cycle then uh, ai will probably probably go through something similar it will be able to do the styles of the different literary geniuses and this and that but eventually it may just find that uh, it breaks down at a certain point then ai scientist and cognitive scientist will uh, fight each other and then finally cognitive science is in love yeah that's what so so that's i mean so so you have a long way to go it's a very exciting time to to do the subjects that you're doing but only be careful of one thing you know don't get into a train and blab at the co passenger without <laughs> buying a ticket <laughs> <laughs> all right